Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Revelation. And if you've read the book of Revelation recently, you understand that it requires some extra challenges, that it's with some extra study to figure out what all those things mean. This is lesson number four in that series for January 26th of 2019. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you now, asking very especially for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we talk about some of these strange things that we read in these chapters. Revelation 4 and 5 presents some challenges. Help us as we work our way through them is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Revelation 2 and 3, which we studied last week, we reviewed the messages from Jesus to John about the seven churches. We saw that they not only represent the local churches in John's day, but they very clearly fit a sequence of, of times down through the history of, of the modern church from, those, from Jesus' day until the second coming of Christ. We all are very familiar now with modern news broadcasts. We sit in our back in our, in our uh, comfortable chairs and we have our remote controls and we flip on the, the newscast and there's someone in New York and he's talking to someone in Washington, D.C. and they're talking about something that's happening in China and they're talking about something else that's happening in Russia and there's the camera just goes like that and we're transported around the world. Well, John was ahead of us because now all of a sudden he's going to take his camera straight to the throne room in heaven. Not just what's going on in the churches here on this earth, we're going to go to the throne room in heaven. Wow, that's quite a trip. But we're going to observe that the throne room in heaven includes a number of individuals that, are named, that, that have certain special significance we're told about four living creatures. We'll find out more about what those are. We're, we we're going to talk about 24 elders. And then we're going to talk about more than 100 million angels. So how big does the throne room of heaven have to be? This is a big place for 100 yeah. million. Unless you start, remember the argument they used to have I don't even know when this started, way back when, how somewhere. Many in there. On the pin? How, many, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? But anyway, yeah, it's a big place. Well, and so far in the book of Revelation, everything that's happened is something that we could pretty easily identify. It's, you know, people standing when they're wearing special robes, and we talk about churches and things that were happening with those churches, and, and those things we can we can picture that pretty easily in our mind. But what happens when you start talking about four living beings with eyes inside and outside and all that kind of stuff and lambs that are slain but they're still alive? Now things are going to get a little, mu a little bit of more of a challenge, a little tougher to understand as we move into chapters 4 and 5 and on through the book of, of Revelation. Um, let's just read those first eight verses of Revelation 4. At this point I had another vision and saw an open door in heaven and the voice that sounded like a trumpet which I had heard speaking to me before said, Come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. At once the Spirit took control of me. There in heaven was a throne with someone sitting on it. His face gleamed like such precious stones as jasper and carnelian and all round the throne there was a rainbow the color of an emerald. In a circle round the throne were twenty-four other thrones on which were seated twenty-four elders dressed in white and wearing gold, crowns of gold. From the throne came four flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne seven lighted torches were burning, which are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. Surrounding the throne on each of its sides were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and behind. The first one looked like a lion, the second looked like a bull, the third had a face like a human face, and the fourth looked like an eagle in flight. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings, and they were covered with eyes inside and out, day and night. They never stopped singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. 
Okay, do you all immediately have a clear picture in your mind of what each one of these things look like? I don't think you can paint those, could you? I mean, how do eyes work on yeah, exactly on wings and one day we'll figure it out. We'll see. Makes Harry Potter look tame in places. Yeah, exactly. Well, clearly God's throne is surrounded by a glorious rainbow. It's a marvelous place, and it's a very busy place. Now, we're reminded by the rainbow of what? Well, the promise. After the, the, promise, the promise. After the flood, God destroyed the earth, according the to the scripture. And in, in, uh, with water, he says, I'll never, I'm never going to do that again. And that's the first mention of a rainbow anywhere, yeah. isn't it? Well, the first mention of rain happened at that time. Um, look at that passage, Genesis 6, 13 to 16. I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be the sign of my covenant with the world. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals that a flood will never again destroy all living things. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it. Remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. That is a sign of the promise which I am making to all living things. So, um, and it goes on, there's something similar in Isaiah 54 where it talks about, In the time of Noah I promised never again to flood the earth. Now I promise not to be angry with you again. I will not reprimand or punish you. The mountains and hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. I will keep forever my promise of peace, so says the Lord, who loves you. So, what do you suppose the rainbow around the throne is supposed to mean to us? Well, in uh, Ezekiel 1, 28, when he's getting to uh -huh. the end of this, uh, which is a very m much a parallel yeah. kind of uh, setup here, as the appearance of the rainbow in the cl clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Um, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So, and uh, his glory is his character, if we go back to Exodus yeah. um, somewhere. So, in R Revelation 4, we've already basically covered Revelation 4. I mean, w at least we've got a, a snapshot picture of what's going on there. If we jump over to the last part of Revelation 5, we, we come to these words, and uh, this starting from verse 11. Again, I looked and heard angels, thousands and millions of them. They stood round the throne, the four living creatures and the elders, and sang in a loud voice, and there's a song of praise. Okay? So, between, what happens? We notice that Satan is not mentioned even once. Why not? Isn't the celebration all about God's victory over Satan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the central issue in the great controversy is the truth about God and the truth about Satan, we might add. God has a right to rule because his rule of love is the only basis on which the universe can safely exist and live together in peace and harmony. Well, we can observe in these passages that God the Father is to be worshipped as representing the creation process. Our very existence was created by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all working together. So one of the reasons why we're celebrating is why? God is our creator, right? Yeah. But there's more to celebrate than just creation. By living the life he lived and dying the death he died, Jesus Christ has accomplished salvation for every tribe, language, nation, and race. Now that doesn't mean we're all going to take advantage of it, but it's there. It's available to everyone. To all who accept his invitation, he's preparing a place for them. So we believe that God created our world in six days. And so by worshiping on the Sabbath, the celebration of those six days of creation, uh, we're looking back to the time, we're looking back to the way it was created in the beginning, but we're also looking forward to the possibility that God will restore it to that condition or perhaps even better in the future. Well, what does it say to you to know that the one who created the entire universe chose to come here, live a life starting from being a baby boy through that incredible ministry that we know about, and finally dying on the cross 
for our sins. What does that say to us, or what should it say to us? Picture of God's love for us. Incredible. Right? What does it say? He died for our sins. Then does he die because of sin? All kinds of implications. Yeah, he died because of sin. Yeah. He came to, to show that, demonstrate that God is righteous, get, demonstrate, demonstrate the truth about God. But uh, the, if when you say he died for our sins, that sounds like paganism to me. Yeah. Well, and and but it's unfortunately it's that's where a lot of Christians still are. I understand uh, that. I, 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 I agree, agree with you with, that it's yeah. it very easily can be understood in paganistic terms. And those elders, what do we know about them? They're, stand, they're, they're seated on, set, on 24 thrones, surrounding the throne of God. I mean, that, these people must be in a pretty important, right? They wear victory crowns. Why are there 24 elders? Well, 24 in the Bible is clearly two sets of 12. It's the first time there's an emphasis on 24 in the Bible. Now, I, that's not quite true. There were 24 rotations in the temple in David's time. The, the, the priests would go home for mo mo much of the year, but then a couple weeks each year, uh, each of the groups of 20, group, uh, one group of, of 24, one of the 24 groups, let me put it that way, would come and, and conduct things at the temple in Jerusalem. But in terms of people, this is the first time a group of 24 are mentioned. Why did they have 24 elders, I mean 24 priests? Was there no, they had. The, he divided all the priests because there was a huge number of priests and, and so forth. And so he divided them into 24 groups. And he says, okay. And so 24 doubled is 48. So it's almost a year. So what he did is, okay, you're going to have the first half of January. You're going to have the second half of January. You're going to have the first half of February. I mean, that's basically it's 12 months. You divide each month in half and you give. 24. So there's 20. David just arbitrarily chose and to divide all the, the all the people from the tribe of Levi into twenty four groups, and he, that's why he divided up their responsibilities. So there's they only have to work two weeks a year. <laughs> well, but remember, the rest of the year they had to go home. Basically, uh, it's not fair to say support themselves because theoretically they were supposed to be supported by the tithe, mm -hmm. but we know historically that the tithe wasn't very reliable. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of times when there was almost no tithe coming in at all. Well, I think they came from anywhere they lived yes. among the tribes. That's right. To do temple time. That's right. Twice a year. Yeah, and out there among the places where they lived, they, they were, were responsible for the local synagogues. They were responsible for teaching, but for judging. They were the government. And so it would be like someone would say, okay, this two weeks, the people from California are going to be in charge of the government in Washington, okay? Oh. The next two weeks, the people in Oregon are being in charge of the, of the government in Washington. That's kind of the idea about... Rotated through rotated. the central... But, they, but when they were not on duty in Jerusalem, they were on duty back home. Mm -hmm. They were the judges. They were the... all that kind of stuff. Okay? Well, it's interesting to notice that the 24 elders are some of the first ones to recognize God's fairness in all he does and to sing his praise. Why is that? And here's the real question. If God were just about to burn his enemies, to throw them into an eternally burning hell, to, to burn on and on and on and on, do you think these 24 elders, which we're, have, we're going to see compelling evidence that they were human beings, do you think they would be celebrating God's rejoicing and praising him for his fairness, love, and kindness? Not likely. Not likely. Not at all likely. Well, notice what they actually say. Look at Revelation 5, 8 to 10. And so he did so, as he did so, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll. Now we're going to see that there's a problem about the scroll, scroll in a little bit. And to break open its seals. For you were killed, and by your sacrificial death you bought for God people from every tribe, language, nation, and race. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on earth. So uh, that's, that was their song. Once again, this suggests that the 24 elders 
are human beings. Uh, so you make them to rule on earth. That sounds like possibly human beings. So who are the four living creatures of Revelation 4 through 6? Well, they are they're also described in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 1, 5 to 14, and Dennis has already given us a little bit from Ezekiel 1, not, not about these guys, but and then in chapter 10, 20 to 22, and with the seraphim. Let's just read, uh, let's try uh, chapter 10, Ezekiel 10, 20 to 22. I recognized them as the same creatures which I had seen beneath the God of Israel at the river Kibar. Each of them had four faces, four wings, and what looked like human hand under each wing. Their faces looked exactly like the faces I had seen by the river Kibar. Each creature moved st straight ahead. And we already known that the four faces were, what were the four creatures? The four different faces? Um, One was a human lion. face. One was a lion's yeah. face. One was a, a cat, was a, an ox or a cat, piece of cattle and or an, an eagle. eagle. Okay. So what do you think each of those things represents? It could mean a direction. Okay. Because they seem like they moved, didn't they, without turning yeah. back and forth? Yeah. So even in Revelation, you, you got the four corners of the earth, you got these yeah. four creatures, so it could be a direction. Yeah. I'm still well, caught up with the 24 elders. I can't leave that for a minute. We'll get back to it, but that's When okay. did they start? I mean, they've always been? We're going we're gonna to get, gonna try to answer your question in just a couple of minutes here, so hold on. Well, in Revelation, he, uh, it mentions uh, the cre different creatures with, only a, uh, with different faces. In mm -hmm. Ezekiel, uh, he's watching a moving Mm -hmm. uh, object. In other words, this mm -hmm. whole uh, throne room is moving, so he sees all four sides of each creature, yeah. and each creature has uh, four those four faces. So, so what do we think? The human might indicate intelligence. The lion might indicate strength. The ox might Im indicate service. Well, that was what oxen were used for back in those days, for sure, for plowing and for all kinds of things in the fields, carrying, pulling carts, etc., etc. And eagle, what would the eagle represent? Swiftness and probably sight. Because, you know, e eagles have those eyes, w central part of their eyes can focus long ways away and see a little tiny things that they're swooping down to catch. Hmm. Well, so here's a comment about that from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, Carrie. The four living creatures symbolize the exalted beings who serve God as his agents and the guardians of his throne. And that's from Psalm 99.1. Their wings point symbolically to their swiftness in carrying out God's orders and their eyes point to their intelligence. Their presence together with the 24 elders and a myriad of angels around the throne mentioned Revelation 5.11 shows that both heaven and earth are represented in the throne room. That comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible study, study Guide, rather. Okay. Well, so now we have this room. We now have an idea. Of, and now I'm going to throw you a question for you to think about. Where did Satan fit in this scheme when he was still Lucifer? He was a cherubim. Okay. Where did they fit? Next to God's throne, wasn't it? Yeah. Close to it. Are they inside of the four living creatures? I think so. Speculation. Okay, we don't have any inspired records about that, just something to think about. Okay. Because these four living creatures seem to symbolize something yeah. more than just, you know, these are... Yeah. Uh, it's it's but they, God's they, whole salvation uh, plan and working uh, out of, uh, of our, our yeah. redemption. Yeah, it seems to symbolize God's connections with everything that's going on in the universe. I mean, remember, we need to remember that people in John's day didn't have any idea about radio transmissions or television transmissions and the idea that you could send out a signal from one spot and it would cover a whole large area. There was nothing, they'd never heard of such a thing. So, you know, these are, these are ideas to try to present things, ways of trying to present ideas to them, I think.
and these may be way representative things way beyond what we can imagine yeah. either <laughs> from our perspective. So in now we get we need to go back to Revelation five one to four. We 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 read in front of it and behind after it, but what is what what about Revelation five one to four? I make this I'm going to make the text here a little bit larger. I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. It was covered with writing on both sides and was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel who announced in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. But there was no one in heaven or on earth or in the world below. What's the world below? Hades. Okay, that's the Greek word. Great. Then tell me what it means. Great. Realm of the dead. The world of the dead who could open the scroll and look inside it. I cried bitterly because no one could be found who was worthy to open the scroll and look inside it. Now we are talking about the throne room of God. And God has a scroll there that no one is qualified to open? How could that be? Because well, Jesus had to do something to make it possible. Uh, it, it wasn't just some random thing. It was necessary in order to set this whole thing in motion. Okay, so we need to remember that in ancient times there were not books like we have with pages. There were scrolls. And so they were rolled up on, usually on a, on a piece of wood, a wooden stick or something like that. And then when it got rolled up, they would take little chunks of sealing wax and they would, they would seal down the last page or the, the end of the roll to the page in front of it and then they would usually put a stamp in it so that uh, you could, if, if something really important w was going out, several people would, different stamps would say, okay, this is really important because this is authorized by all these people and then only the person it was addressed to would have the permission to open it and, and, and read it. I mean, this was, and to have seven seals, that's a big deal. <coughs> okay, Margaret, I think you're going to tell us something more about okay, that. Okay, so what does this scroll represent? Why is it important? Then in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences, the prophetic, hi the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic council of the eternal and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. This comes from Ellen G. White Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 7.2. And I can tell you that uh, there are some other places where that idea is more or less repeated. We'll look at some other of those places a little bit later in our discussion. Well, so you just heard that. What what does that imply? Is this uh, history of the, the history of the world? Sounds like it. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Yeah, but well, the sealed, salvation, right? Is, yeah, the salvation history moving yeah. forward from this point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it's sealed. It's sealed. Well, when they break each of the seals. You don't read it until all the seals are broke. That's right. So, what are we going to do? Well, we read the next chapter and it uh, unfolds. Well, we don't, even, we don't even have to read the next chapter. We can That'll read. be ne next week, probably. Well, yeah. So, why is Christ, the only being in the whole universe, worthy to open that scroll? The Father can't open the scroll. The Holy Spirit can't open the scroll. None of the angels, none of the living creatures. Well, look at Revelation 5, 5 to 7. Maybe this will help us. Next, the next three verses. Then one of the elders said to me, Don't cry, look, the lion from Judah's tribe, the great descendant of David, has won the victory, and he can break the seven seals and open the scroll. Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent throughout the whole world, earth. Now, we, I mentioned this earlier. How many of you have seen a lamb with seven eyes or seven horns? We're not used to that kind of stuff. The lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. And then next week, we're going to talk about what happens when he opens that scroll. 
So the one who is able to open that scroll is the one who has won the great controversy by coming and representing God to us here on this earth. And in the process of representing God, who does he also represent? The truth about Satan, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. So it's God's way of dealing with Satan's rebellion. Surely, 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 the rebellion of heaven was a crisis. I, you know, look at Revelation 12, which we'll get to after a while. Uh, now we see the answers to all of Satan's accusations. The one who has given us those answers was the Son, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. What do we mean when we say he was slain from the foundation of the world? He didn't die until Calvary. The plan was put in place. The plan was in place, exactly. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit gathered together, made a plan. They knew exactly what was going to happen way back before our world was created. Well, there's some interesting, an interesting passage that comes up next in, in Revelation 8. Uh, Revelation, I'm sorry, 5, verses 8 to 14. Look at that. As he did so, he took the, thro the, the scroll and opened it, the four living creatures and the twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They sang a new song. You're worthy to open the scrolls to break open its seals. We've already read that earlier. So you are worthy. What are we implying when we say that? You can do it. You yeah. can do it. You it's have authority to. Not just because you have authority. You see, if, if it was just a question of God's power, he could have solved the great controversy in an instant. It would never have gotten out of heaven. He would have just destroyed Lucifer uh, even before he spread his, his evil to the next angel. So it's not a question about God's power. It's not just a question about how God mops up the, the mess at the end of the world. God has to win the great controversy. And what do we mean when we say God has to win the great controversy? Well, Christ, uh, well, his life and his death was an answer to all of Satan's accusations against God, that God was not what Satan made him out to be. Exactly. And those answers have to be so clearly demonstrated that every being who has ever lived in the history of our world, or universe really, in the history of our universe, will be able to say, yes, God, you did it right. You, you're, you know, Satan was defeated. His accusations are completely false. We will not accept them. And At long last, everyone, it says, will kneel. I can acknowledge. Exactly. At the final end of Sin and Sinners, you're going to see everyone, including Satan's side, say, you were right. So, where do you find that in Scripture? Philippians. Well, we just read it. Philippians 2. And look at, look at two places. One of them is right here in Revelation 5. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, and the world below, and in the sea, all living beings in the universe, and they were singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory might forever and ever. What are we saying here? We're saying God has won the great controversy. And as already been mentioned, that same idea is Philippians 2, 10 and 11. Look at that. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And who else is going to be on their knees? Oops. Satan himself mm -hmm. will be on his knees making that admission. Why will he be making that admission? Does he have flashes of sanity by that time? <laughs> he, he really well, I suppose, that, I suppose that's one possibility. I hate to he use really the term, he's alive and well, right. because yeah. uh, this, the insanity on the part of the... There is going to be a panorama in the sky, and the entire history of the great controversy is going to be spread out there. And at the end of that, when everybody, not just the people inside the city, but the people outside, the wicked, all the people and the wicked on the outside, will also see that panorama. And each person will realize exactly what Satan has done. 
all of his accusations. They will see God's answers to all those accusations. They will see the part each one of them has played in that great controversy. And when that's all over, there will be nothing to be said except the truth. Nothing will stand up except the truth. So this will lead to all of them praising and honoring his holy name, not because they really want to in terms of the wicked outside, but because they're compelled to do so by the truth. Not, not by coercion, physical force, just by the f power of the truth. Well, if Satan is the person that's a liar, yeah. how's that going to... How's that going to change him? So how do you, well, how do you defeat a liar? Well, if he's a liar, you tell the truth. You, even the truth doesn't really matter, does it? Well, it, it, if it, you're a liar, yeah, well, but he may be, uh, he may not. Feel many it years in his ago, heart, but if he says, he says it, then then he's uh, attempting me, to lie. Let and me uh, says, give you an illustration. A number uh, of years ago, there was a famous sports figure. I won't mention by name, who was on trial for murdering his wife and the wife's friend. Everybody in America, it seemed like, had their television sets glued to that trial. And it ends up he, he was acquitted because they didn't think there was enough evidence to convict him. Now, another case came along later and overturned that, that conviction, more or less. But try to imagine how that trial would have gone if God had been in charge. He would say, everybody, sit back and relax. Let me show you exactly, what happened? 3D living color, exactly what happened. And at the end of half an hour of presentation, does the jury have to deliberate? No doubt. Mm -hmm. No question about exactly what happened. And it's, that's, what'll, that's the way it'll be at, when the panorama is shown. There will, it will be perfectly obvious who did what and why. There won't be any, any reason to argue. It's, it's, the answers are perfectly obvious. So there'll be no more interpretation needed? No. Nope. Not in terms possible, of... But <laughs> <what>? <laughs> I don't know if that's possible because you always interpret. Well, but at least... I mean, I remember Rodney King. Yeah. We well, had but, the video there and... We knew exactly what happened, and yet the well, verdict was different. Yeah, well, okay. And human, co human courts can be manipulated and all that kind of yeah, stuff. But humans, humans still have to agree, right? Well, I'm so. saying that the evidence is going to be so compelling after the panorama is shown that even Satan will be, the Bible says so. Even Satan will be down on his knees saying, God, you did it right. That's, 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 that's the only evidence I can point to. Okay. We got to talk about the divinity of Christ here. This is taken from the uh, adult teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide, page 55. It's quite a picture. Look at the five hymns being sung around the throne of God. That's from Revelation 4, 8 to 11, 5, 9 to 13. The divinity of Christ is underlined in the progression of five hymns in this vision. The first two hymns praise the one sitting on the throne. Maybe we should, I should interrupt just a little bit. It's talking about those passages, each one's about, a, about one verse long or maybe two verses long. It's talking about all praise and honor and glory goes to God. So they're, they're calling those hymns. And there's five of them, two in, in Revelation 4 and three of them in Revelation 5 and verses 9 to 13. The first two hymns praise the one sitting on the throne. The third and fourth hymns praise the Lamb. The fifth hymn offers worship to both the one sitting on the throne and the Lamb. The fifth hymn is the clear climax of the series in which blessing, honor, glory, and power are claimed as belonging to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Mm -hmm. A second feature of these hymns also highlights the fifth hymn. It is the climax of a grand crescendo of singing. The first hymn is sung by the four living creatures. The second hymn is sung by the 24 elders. The third is sung by four, both the four living creatures and the 24 elders. The 
fourth hymn is sung by more than a hundred million angels, according to Re Revelation 5, 11, and 12. The fifth hymn is sung by every creature in the universe. Wow. So the fifth hymn is the climax of a great crescendo as all attention focuses on the throne affirming the divinity of the Lamb. And that's by every creature in the universe. Can you imagine that? That's going to be that? pretty yeah. noisy, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I, I like to call it a grand harmony. Let's not just call it noisy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a lot of voices. I don't know if you, I've had the privilege, of, and some of you have probably have too, of, of being in places, and I think of being at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, on occasion where they've had choirs of maybe 200 or 300 people. And if they practice enough together so they get really good harmony, it is marvelous to have a choir that size. I mean, how about a couple hundred million? Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. I think the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sounds pretty good. Yep. If you watch them at their general conference, yeah. you've taken a tour through that building. It's astounding. Yeah. So let's look at those hymns that we've just mentioned. Um, the progression of the five hymns. Let's, let's, we're going to just pick out the hymns. So, Dennis? Uh, Revelation. <coughs> Four, uh, verses 8 to 11, each one of the four living creatures had six wings and they were covered with eyes inside and out. Day and night they never stopped singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Now, let's just notice <clears throat> the first hymn is the four living creatures singing by themselves, okay? The four living creatures sing songs of glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. When they do so, the 24 elders fall down before the one who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They throw their crowns down in front of the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things and by your will they were given existence and life. So the 24 elders do what? They sing the second hymn, right? And Jim? As he did so, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break open its seals. For you were killed, and by your sacrificial death you brought forth God, excuse me, you brought for God people from every tribe, language, nation, and race. You have made them a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they shall rule on earth. I look, excuse me, and again, excuse me, again I looked, and I heard angels, thousands of millions of them. They stood around the throne and the four living creatures and the elders and sang in a loud voice. The lamb who was killed is worthy. He received power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, in the world below, to, and in the sea, all the living beings in the universe, and they were singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and might forever and ever. Good News Bible. So there's the five hymns of Revelation 4 and 5. And um, let's just take a moment and look at Acts 2, 32 to 36. God has raised, this is in Peter's sermon back there in Pentecost, God has raised this very Jesus from death and we are all witnesses to this fact. He has been raised to the right-hand side of God, his Father, and has received from him the Holy Spirit as he had promised. What we, you now see and hear is his gift that he has poured out on us. For it was not David who went up into heaven. Rather, he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit here at my right until I put your enemies as a footstool, footstool under your feet. So these hymns come from the Old Testament some of them in detail. So Revelation 5, 6, compare the following paragraph from L. Read Revelation 5, 6. Let's just do that really quickly. 
Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. It had seven heads and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that had been sent throughout the whole earth. Okay? So, Christ's ascension to heaven. I'm reading now from Acts of the Apostles, uh, 38 and 39. Christ's ascension to heaven was a signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned among the adoration of the angels. As soon as the ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth and was the anointed one over his people. Well, so how do you feel about having someone who used to be a human being who is also the creator of the universe, pleading our cases. And remember now, it... Well, he still is a human being. Yes, he still is, yeah. But it, uh, I guess you would say, yeah, like that. he was once a human being as a human being here on this earth. He's now a human being in heaven, yeah. Um, well, he's a raised human being. Uh, he's a raised he's human something being. Something might be something a little different than yeah. before. Glorified body. Still with those 24 elders. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, are they human beings? Yeah. We're, we're we've, got, we've got four creatures there. That's yeah. 28. They seem to go together. The four living creatures, pretty otherworldly in their description. Yeah. But the four el 24 elders seem like something we can comprehend. Yeah. So we're getting there. Where'd they get there? Hold on. How'd they get there? So are you happy about this, the good news that Jesus is there? What is he doing? Well, the important thing is to recognize that when Jesus pleads our case, if we had time, we would go back and read Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. When Jesus pleads our cases, he's not pleading just before the Father. He's before the living creatures, before the 24 elders, and before hundreds of millions of angels. And Daniel 7 says exactly that. So it's not God who is, he's trying to convince to save us. It's the entire, the rest of the universe that need to be convinced that it's safe to live next door to us for the rest of eternity. Okay, so should we praise God for that kind of a plan? Absolutely. Do we understand the issues in the great controversy? Do we understand how they were answered? Does to knowing the answers of those to those questions help you to stand firmly on God's side in the great controversy? Let me just take an answer, uh, an example very quickly. What did God say to Adam? The first recorded message of God to Adam in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Do you remember? Anyone who eats of the tree, what will happen? Surely die. They will surely die. They will surely die. What did devil say in the beginning of the next chapter? You won't die. You won't die. So, who's telling us the truth? Here are two powerful beings with exactly contradictory statements. This is just an example. There's a lot more, but this is a simple example. So, how would you decide, how would you determine who to believe? Well, we have to believe God because we are dying. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's one. But it turns out that God says it's sin that kills you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any evidence that sin kills? Every day. Yeah, every day. Okay, well, every day. But the sin that actually kills people, not just as a, as a side effect, like the, all the sins we're talking about, the only person who has died directly of sin so far in the history of our world was Jesus. Yeah. And that was collateral. It wasn't Jesus' sin. Yeah. It was somebody else's yeah. sin, yeah, exactly. which affected... Yeah, exactly. But the point is, this is what happens when someone dies of sin. He died the death of sinners. Lots of evidence for that. And so now, 
Who was right? God was right. How does God prove him prove that he was right? He demonstrates. That's yeah. pretty important to see. Romans three twenty five and twenty six. Yeah. Yeah. Demonstrate what sin does. Yeah. It's an education process. So now let's get back to our to our scroll. Revelation five. Let's look at some of the questions that are raised. What is implied by the fact that everyone standing around is continually offering praise to the Father and the Son? What evidence is there that this is a continuing and ongoing process? I suppose we should go back to Luke 15. Just, just for a person, just quickly, look back at, at Luke 15, verses 7 and 10. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent, and that's repeated in verse 10. So how many times does heaven have reason to rejoice? Every redeemed soul. Every redeemed soul. Okay, so that's an ongoing process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we've got a paragraph here that gives us some additional information. Um, let's see, I guess, Dennis, I think that's yours. Uh, Is that yours? I think we're back to Carrie, aren't we? Yeah, I think it I'm is. sorry, Carrie. Three pieces of evidence indicate that chapter 4 is not a one-time event, but a general description of heavenly worship. And then they divide it up in numbers here a little. Number one, the throne in verse 2 is not set up, rather it was standing continually in heaven. And then it gives some Greek there in the tense. Number two, the that sink. That tense, I can just tell you for the Greek. That imperfect tense means it's, it's, it's going on. It's, it's continuing. Okay. Go ahead. The singing in verse 8 is not a single episode. It goes on, quote unquote, day and night. Number three, the singing of the four living creatures is continuously repetitive. And then they have whenever in, in, in because it's each time it says whenever, and we already saw when is the whenever, whenever a sinner turns back to God. Okay. So this is this is not doesn't begin it doesn't end it just goes on and on right. Yeah. Repeatedly we are told in the book of Revelation that worship happens when God can be trusted, because God can be trusted He has won the great conflict mercy and now he is reigning unopposed in heaven so who are the 24 elders margaret well, you're going to answer your husband's question there yeah in matthew 19 28 jesus tells his disciples that they will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel this verse ties together with the number 12 thrones the apostles and the 12 tribes in Revelation 21:12, the names of the 12 tribes are written on the gates of the New Jerusalem, while the 12 foundations have the names of the 12 apostles written on them. This is in Revelation 21:14. The number 24 adds, up, adds 12 to 12, as occurs in Revelation 21. In Revelation 7, 4 to 8, furthermore, the people of God are described in terms of 12 times 12 times 1,000, that would be 144,000. The multiple of 12 is seen also in the height of the walls of the New Jerusalem, 144 cubits, that's from Revelation 21:17. So the best explanation of the 24 elders is that they represent the people of God in both the Old and the New Testament. This is from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Yeah. I guess I'm a little more specific in that. I have a hard time saying that they represent all the people of God when in heaven it's talking about them being there now, 24. Okay. So, so do we want to take that as the disciples are there as well as the sons of Jacob, all 12 of them? And that's who we're talking about? Well, Some I mean, of this seems like speculation to me. Well, yeah. that couldn't have been because John saw this and John is one of the 12 disciples. So yeah. he couldn't have been up there already. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to get a little bit more information. Possibly it's Lots figurative because yeah. Yeah. obviously the, the 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 foundations of the city of God and the gates in the city of God have these names on them. 
So I think it's figurative. Yeah. Why is that sealed it's scroll? Interesting to think about. Yeah. I wouldn't put a whole lot of gospel. Yeah. Say that's truth. Okay. Well, it's it's the best guess we have so far. Why is that sealed scroll so important? Look at the following two passages from Ellen White. Thus the Jewish leaders, well, okay. That's uh, yours. That's Jim. Yeah. I'm still thinking about this. So. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm looking at that saying, the adult teacher's Sabbath school Bible guide came up with this, and it seems uh, rather fanciful. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, why is that sealed scroll so important? Look at the following two passages from Ellen White. Thus the Jewish leaders made their choice. Their decision was registered in the book which John saw in the hand of him that sat upon the throne, the book which no man could open. In all its vindictiveness, this decision will appear before them in the day when this book is unsealed by the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's from Christ Objects Lessons. Okay. And then I'll go on here. Mm -hmm. There in his open hand lay the book, the role of the history of God's providences, the prophetic history of nations and the church. Herein was contained the divine utterances, his authority, his commandments, his laws, the whole symbolic counsel of the eternal, and the history of all ruling powers in the nations. In symbolic language was contained in that role the influence of every nation, tongue, and people from the beginning of Earth's history to its close. Wow. So it sounds like what we have here is basically what God is going to show in the panorama. The whole history of the human race, God's actions, what we have done, how, that, how we're involved, we see that the Jewish leaders, what they did with Jesus was recorded in that place. Right down to here. Um, very, very impressive. So, having said all of that, why do we say that the Lamb is worthy? <coughs> They're singing hymn to that effect. What do we mean when we say worthy? Worthship? Has to do with I mean, it was a root of uh, wor the word something has value and, and what you're saying is the word worship actually comes from worthship, yeah. and so the whole universe is re rejoicing over what Jesus has accomplished and answering the questions in the great controversy. I think that's what we're talking about here. In order to save human beings and to win the great controversy in the eyes of the entire universe. God did something absolutely extraordinary, unexpected, and remarkable. He chose to become a human baby. And, I mean, try to think of Satan's situation here for just a moment. We need to think of both sides. We don't want to spend too much time thinking like Satan, but once in a while we have to think like Satan a little bit. When, when Jesus was born, or even when he, Satan realized he was coming, he must have rejoiced. Because he said, every single person that's lived on planet Earth so far, I have managed to get him to sin. Mm -hmm. Here comes a baby boy, I'm going to get this kid. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was rejoicing in the, in, the, in the councils of Satan. But what happened? Jesus lived that life, lived the life of what would, have, would appear to people looking on at the time as an ordinary human being. Mm -hmm. He conducted that ministry for three years, which was anything but ordinary. And then he died of sin while hanging on a cross. Thus, he made it clear that we have a choice. We can choose to live a life like Jesus lived and end up living with God for the rest of eternity, or we will die the way Jesus died, separated from God, dead for eternity. Okay, remember that from the beginning of the great controversy in heaven, Lucifer, otherwise later known as Satan, has denied the divinity of Christ and demanded that he, Lucifer, be treated as equal or superior to Christ in all his activities. Is it clear now, from, even from the little bit we know of the life and death of Jesus, that there is no comparison between Christ 
and Lucifer. No. I mean, no. you know, <laughs> it's even ridiculous to discuss, even to talk about comparing them. He said, Lucifer said, I will exalt my throne. Uh, and my. Jesus laid, uh, uh, laid all that aside and mm -hmm. condescended to become a, what you just said there. It goes through it in <laughs> Philippians 2 there. Satan wanted to get to that position. Christ was willing to lay it aside for a period of time and then to take it up again. Amazing. So what we're suggesting is that God has to win the great controversy, not just cleanse this world of evil and remake it into a new heaven and a new earth. No, he has to convince the entire universe that he, his government is perfectly transparent. Everything he's done is fair and honest and open. And tell every single being, including Satan himself, will have to say, God, there's nothing more you could have done. Yeah. That's, that's, to win the great controversy in that way is just astounds me every time I think about it. That process is persuasion, isn't it? Yeah. And it, which is the same thing as or faith, belief, trust. Mm -hmm. And it's an education process to bring that about. It's no short, you can't short circuit it. So now I'm going to ask you a tough question. And you out there, I want to include you in this question. Is God's name praised and honored by the way you worship God at church? Does the great controversy enter into your Sabbath school class discussions? Our churches are not supposed to be comfortable places where we gather in like some kind of a club to associate together. We go there to worship God, and that worship should be all about God. We're not just going there to be entertained even by the pastor. He might have some great things to say, but that's not what we're there for. We are there to worship God, and there's many places in the Bible that stories, I think, especially of Second Chronicles 20, uh, read that if you get a chance and see what God has been able to do. So what do we see? We see that we need to worship God because created, He created. We worship God because He's redeemed us from sin. We worship God because He's going to be able to make heaven and earth over again and give us a place to live there for, forever. Amen. What more could we ask? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. What more could we possibly say? along with these beings who are said to, to, to inhabit your throne room in heaven, we wish to be a part of that glorious and praise, praiseworthy group. Um, to be, we wish we could know more about the living creatures and know more about the 24 elders and know more about the angels, but one day we will be a part of that. And we're already told here in Revelation 5 that one day we will sing the song with them praising your name and honoring what you have done for us. May that praise and honor begin even today as our prayer in Jesus' name.